it's now um, 7 of 3. Should we go through this? First questions about Surat al Humza. First questions related to the tafsir. Um, I just I had two. One was I was wondering what the occasion for this surah was. Like oh. what exactly happened, or what what did the Muslims experience? Would the Prophet see that occasion this revolution? Yeah. There, there is a, a considerable amount of disagreement about. Uh, the, whether this was a revelation with an occasion. Uh, some have said that it was revealed in response to Walid ibn al-Mughira, who was among the aristocracy in Mecca, uh, and who was known for his wealth, and uh, known for his arrogance, known for his slaves, he had a, a, a lot of slaves, and also known for persecuting Muslims. But what's really interesting so the reports that come from the Hadith tradition said he, here's a list of names that possibly this could have been uh, uh, describing. Uh, Ubay bin Khalaf, uh, the Amma, Ammar said this. Jamil bin Amir al-Jumahi, Mujahid said this. Al-Akhnas bin Shurayyak al-Thaqafi, Sudi said this. And Ibn Jurayh is the one who said it was revealed about Walid ibn Mughira. But قول الأكثرين the the majority view or the majority of scholars said إنها مرسلة على العموم من غير تخصيص that it would it has no occasion for revelation that it was a, a revelation on the moral condition uh, I have in the past this was years ago, I've looked at the traditions by Ammar and Mujahid and Sunti and Ibn Jurayh. Uh, and all the reports that it refers to Walid ibn Mughira or Akhnas ibn Shurayyah or, or Ibn Amir or uh, Ibn Ibn Khalaf, Ubay ibn Khalaf, um, are unreliable. They're, they're speculative. Uh, in other words, they, they're, they're deducted from from the early comment, early generation of commentators in the uh, second century, where they they say it must have been about this person or that person, but there's nothing reliable. Uh, the, and I think the majority position that it is uh, without an occasion uh, is correct. That's, that's a good question. Yes, sir. You had mentioned that there was uh, other eyes in the Quran that Allah sarcastically, and you said there were books in Arabic. I'm just curious uh, what the books are. Yeah, there is a, a, a PhD dissertation that was written in the 70s. Uh, I think it was 76 or 78. It's one of these two years. And it's called Uslub al Bala al Sukhriya al Balaghiya. Yeah, Uslub al Sukhriya al Balaghiya for Quran. That's the main one that I had in mind. There, um, there are other, there are a number of other PhD dissertations. The ones that I know are all, are all Azhari uh, that have a chapter on on a Sukhriya Quran, um, um, and they're, they they're all on Al Balagh of Quran. Mm -hmm. they're, they're all under the general rubric of Balagh of Quran, and then they have a chapter normally or or exception. Thank you. 
does the Kutama will only be given for someone who has the personality that likes to amass wealth and you know just cutting up their money every time admiring it? Are no, El Kutama, El Kutama, that what we will translate as the crusher. But it, it is that this this combobulating and the deconstructing of of the ego. The it, it's actually f that same meaning features in several it, in several parts of the Quran. The, so it is it, meaning the, the point is, is that the nature of Jahannam, that nature is that it will be. Um, it will deconstruct egos. Uh, it, it will break down uh, every, egot every, every egotistical attitude accompanied by injustice. Uh, you do have some, the, the Sufis talk about whether egos un not accompanied by injustice. In other words, people who were egotistical but they didn't Ibn Arabi says it's, says it's impossible that, that egoism always is accompanied by injustice. Ibn Arabi thinks it's impossible for egoism to exist without injustice. Uh, Allah Alam. Um, but the point is, is that that description of Jahannam, you can generalize it as to the state of being. Jahannam, that God's punishment in the hereafter uh, will not uh, will not allow arrogance to stand without response. My my teachers, and I, I've said this before, and I've actually said it to you. If you hear back the Holocaust that I gave 20 years ago, I, I used to talk about this much more. Um, we were taught that the vast majority of sin, sin starts with an egotistical state. That the the the. And uh, the, the, uh, the key to taqwa is to confront and to control your ego. And so the emphasis in, in building a Muslim character, which is equal to a virtuous character, uh, was to first and first and foremost to confront your ego and your 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 our tendency towards arrogance. Our we're driven towards arrogance because <coughs> of the divine part in us. Er, it, it, the, the only one we were taught the only one that can handle arrogance without injustice is Allah. Everyone other than Allah cannot handle this. The, the arrogance will inevitably draw them to minimizing the rights of others and aggrandizing their own rights. They will always understate the suffering of others and overstate their own sense of uh, being wronged, and and it is it, it, it what I remember how we would go through exercises of practicing empathy. I mean, I'm I'm always amazed, and it made me admire the old school. I have to say, because in in, in the the modern methods of pedagogy. You, you, we don't do any of that. I mean, you. you uh, but it, the old methods of pedagogy, when when you are asked to sit there and to think, 
to articulate the the virtues of your mother or the virtues of your father or the virtues of your sister, the virtues of your brother, and all the ways that they are right and you are wrong, and to do the exercise over and over and over, and then to do it with neighbors, and then to do it, you know, and, and, and it, was, it was very healthy. At first it felt weird, but ultimately it was very healthy because then you, you really would start noticing eventually how you tend to see everything from your own perspective, uh, and you project onto others whatever is convenient for you. And you assume things, and that if you're very honest, you catch yourself falling in these contradictions, which is uh, the heart of hypocrisy. Hassan bin Abdul Ghani, Hassan Abdul Ghani, uh, one of my teachers wrote, uh, a, a really good book that he used to have halakas on called the Munafiqun wa Shu'ab al Nifaq, um, which talks about uh, how you you know the, the mechanics of catching you catching yourself uh, uh, catching hypocrisy within the self and the nature of hypocrisy within the sense is a contradiction. That you know what, what you condemn others for. At one point, you forgive yourself for. At another point, and what you forgive yourself for at one point, you condemn others for at another point, and that's the heart of hypocrisy. What's the difference between pride and arrogance, or is there a difference? The interesting thing is in that in, in Arabic, um, there is no singular word for pride. There is two words for confidence, a thiqa bin nafs, or a thiqa. So, it, interesting that in Arabic the dichotomy is between confidence and arrogance. And which is more just than pride and arrogance, yeah. because you know, in in, in Kierkegaard, when he, when he when he looked at he writes about Kierkegaard and Jung, these two, they they talked a lot about pride and its relationship to the ego, and and un, and Jung and Kierkegaard, unlike Freud didn't see the ego as playing a healthy part, but actually saw it as a, often the mechanism and a, and a tool for arrogance and so on. And often when you read this material, you, you think to yourself, you know, if English had the dichotomy between confidence and arrogance, it would have been epistemologically far more workable than the dichotomy between pride and arrogance. Um, but generally speaking, we're not, it, it, when we say pride that is acceptable, it's usually in the sense of confidence that you you, you deal with yourself justly. Uh, you, you you are not unjust to yourself, A and you know your 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 worth. It, arrogance is when you for, forgive and ignore your moral faults, even when you are inflicting injustice against others. You know, God, uh, and this is another, I mean, inshallah, hopefully we'll get to that, but the, Allah's forgiveness when it comes to the rights of other human beings is contingent on the forgiveness of other human beings. The, among the, the disasters of Wahhabi school is that they convince Muslims that you can go to Hajj and um, the, your, the, even even the injustices you've committed another against other human beings will be just forgiven and erased, and and that that's that's a, uh, uh, that, that's a modern thing. The, the the injustices you commit against other human beings ultimately God has the power to forgive. If the if the other human beings 
stingily or unreasonably do not extend forgiveness, but they are the possessor of prime rights. And this is an important point because it, it, if you are unjust towards other human beings, if you're unjust towards yourself or unjust towards God, then that's up to God to forgive without any impediment. But if you are unjust towards other human beings, um, it, 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 making amends is, is a very serious theological endeavor. The whole process of tawbah and how to undertake tawbah by making amends uh, yeah, there's just there's just so much about that, and, and inshallah we'll get to the to the parts of the Quran that, that talk about um, um, Sorry, Toba. Toba is, is is the process of of uh, um, uh, of no, uh, <coughs> um, atonement, atonement. So uh, atoning for your sins. Uh, you know, it, it is not always possible to address the rights of other human beings. So, it's, you know, sometimes we just, we do everything in our ability to atone and beg God to make these human beings whole and to forgive us anyway. But we are, we are, there is a, a, a if you, I mean, if those who read Arabic, you can read some, uh, I actually mentioned it in, in search, and, uh, search for Beauty in one of the chapters. Uh, Ibn Arabi in Ahkam al-Quran has a very, has a really nice discussion about this, that the presumption always has to be that if you, uh, the atonement is contingent on making amends towards other human beings and the injustices that we've committed. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, question. Um, about the, the part where you mentioned about secular versus religious morality, specifically the difference between reward and punishment based accountability. Um, shouldn't seekers perform moral acts for the sake of its intrin intrinsic value of beauty and virtue and not for reward or punishment. He's reminded of the story of Rabi al Adawiyah running with fire. I guess the, the poem about her burning down the gates of fire. Yeah. Well, there, there, is a, there is a difference here and, and it's a little bit subtle. Um, when we say philosophically morality doesn't cohere without punishment and reward in the hereafter, it, it goes back to this question of what is the source of obligation? The, 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 the taklif, the, the source of, the philosophical source of obligation. Now, if we think just philosophically, we can say, okay, well, obligation can be because um, it derives from a higher moral principle. Like, for instance, all obligations derive from the moral principle of do unto others like you want done unto you. But then, of course, that begs the question of what is the source of that broad norm? What is the source of that prior obligation? And then we get to the ultimate question of origins, the philosophical question of origins. And here, you either say, well, it originates in something innate, like nature, or it originates in a theoretical, hypothetical covenant that has a social contract between human beings. It, in other words, it, ori it originates in a closed philosophical circle. Or you'd say, well, it originates because of something outside that closed philosophical circle that created the obligation in the first place, that, that created the very, very a priori obligation. And that's the big philosophical debate. 
between the secular and non-secular. Now, in this is separate from the question of is it a virtue to reach a level of moral consciousness where you no longer covet the reward or fear the punishment. In other words, it's like, and this goes back to Rabbah actually, that you fell in love with the philosophical origin, the, 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 the creator of the obligation, and achieved such a unity of being, such a wahda, that your impulses are, have become one and the same with the, the maker, the divine Lord. And that is, you know, ultimately when, when uh, um, uh, the, the people like Ibn Arabi or, or Shilani or, or, you know, when, when, they, uh, uh, when they talk about Wahdat al-Wujud and uh, al-Ittihad and, and, and so on, they, they talk about that you elevate yourself morally to the point that your impulses become according to the Creator. So you, you become one and the same. But this requires not, it requires a complete abolition of ego. Because if you have any ounce of ego, then your impulses cannot be one and the same with the Creator. Which even Raba or any of Rumi or Hafiz or any of them would say it's the rare exception. Only very few people are able to achieve that. And they do, they do not deny that philosophically that the obligation itself needs to be from a creator because they do not deny the, the necessity of a creator. In fact, they embrace it. But what, they, what they're saying is that you should become so virtuous that you don't become a god, but that you dilute yourself into God. And, and that's an argument about virtue ethics, not about philosophical roots. And so, yeah, it is a moral virtue, but it, it, it is also the, the warning is those who, without having gone through the process of evascuation of ego, you know, their ego is this big, and they say, oh, we don't think about hellfire and, and, and reward or punishment. But you're all about your ego. I mean, so effectively what you're saying is, we don't care about rewards, but we worship ourselves. And the whole, when, when uh, when Allah de describes the nature of the message of Ibrahim, of Abraham, uh, onwards to all the prophets, is, is one of Islam. It, it's that that it is not possible to break the cycle of self idolatry without first the act of submission to God. And you know, it, it, when I uh, you mentioned uh, Alcoholic uh, Anonymous and so on. I mean, what, what, what always amazes me is that when I, I read this literature, it, it starts out with you cannot defeat your, 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 the boogeyman of addiction, the, the monster of addiction, without first acknowledging your submission to a higher being. And that just is 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 mind blowing because it's it's uh, the, the it's like what we were been saying all along. What the entire message message of Islam is all along. And one other thing is that when when I see um, what has come out of philosophical self idolatry, including the neocons or the, the right-wing uh, capitalists, the, the ideology of capitalism or, or fascism and so on, the, the whole point of human being as, as basically the end-all and the, 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 the god, the godhead, 
or uh, Iron, uh, uh, or um, what's her name, uh, Iron Gold, um, and her book, The Fountainhead, and, and all that was on. It's it's uh, it, it speaks volumes. It just it. Um, I mean, subhanAllah, it, it, uh, when, when I engage the, the, the folks from the Federalist Society, it's literally as if the Quran is describing their, their white privilege and their arrogance and their, you know, their, their sense of entitlement, the way they look at the world was just from the tip of their nose and everyone is beneath them and the suffering of others doesn't count unless they're from their own little privileged background. And, A, a, a good threatening fire would do them a lot of good. <laughs> um, I had two questions. I hope one is brief. I was wondering, um, in this surah, um, Allah uses the term afida for hearts, and I'd never. I was wondering, is there a particular reason why that word is chosen for hearts? Because I know in Arabic there's a bunch of words for heart, and I was wondering if there's a specific reason. For that word, yeah, um, there is the uh, fuad. Uh, okay, there are. It, 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 it's one of the very fascinating things. You know how semiology and semiotics and the study of language can tell you a lot about the culture that you studied language and how many words for something can tell you an amazing great deal. Well, one of the things about Arabic is the number of words that refer to the heart. And that, and that that's because of the role of romance, uh, romanticism and the, the, and the, the, uh, the spirit in Arabic language. But anyway, so there is muhja, which could refer to the heart in the sense of essence. There's qalb, which could refer to the heart in the sense of a source of being, in a, in a, in a more physical sense. And then fu'ad. Fu'ad could refer to the heart in the sense of the soul, and afida, especially when it's used in the plural, could refer to the to the soul of the of, of the being, or could refer to the internal organs. So afida could actually mean internal organs, and that is why, in the first layer of meaning, when it said taqali al afida, the 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 literalist said. It means that the fire will penetrate through the skin and reach the organs. So it's a very straightforward, literal meaning. What, what the second layer of interpretation the, 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 it said, no, the fire penetrates through the surface and reaches the, the spirit, the, 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 the collective souls. Um, yeah. It wouldn't, uh, the, the other thing is, notice that if it said, if you said tattali ala al the meaning would, sh would change completely. Because then if you said tattali ala al it would mean it will know the secrets of people. So mm -hmm. the, the choice of word here is, is significant. Tattali ala al means that you, you know what, the, what people are hiding inside of their hearts. It wouldn't have that literal meaning of actually reaching within the self. If you say المهج, that would then mean um, it will know the the secret longings of people. So is like it's typical of the Quran. It, it, you can't replace it with any other word and get the same meaning. That was my question, actually. Okay. That was Sorry, your question. Yeah. You had a second question. Oh, yeah, I was just wondering. Um, so you talked about uh, arrogance as a, a, a failure to to ignore one's own moral failings. 
So does that mean that humility is the ability to recognize your own moral failings? And the reason why I ask this is because one of my favorite poems is T.S. Eliot, and he has a line that says, humility is endless. And so from the, is the Muslim understanding then that humility is just the ability to recognize one's own moral failings? No. It, 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 humility, I think if you would have asked any of um, either my teachers or uh, any of the, the, the like even uh, someone like Hamid al-Ghazali or asked um, any of the mystical um, interpreters, commentators on the Quran, I think all of them would say humility is endless. Uh, it, it just, and, and I agree with that. Um, it begins with recognizing your own moral feelings. It's a necessary condition. If you, if you don't see yourself with transparency, it's not only that, um, it's not only that you, humility is not possible, but even love is not possible. Um, because when we love, we most often we project ourselves onto the other person. And then quite often what we are really loving is we love ourselves. And we're just projecting ourselves onto the other person. And then the, the person that is the object of our love feels confused and unloved eventually because they discover that you actually don't know them. Um, humility is, is a necessary, it, 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 seeing yourself with transparency is, is a necessary condition for so many of the virtues of life. But it, it, the, re, the reason humility is endless is that in, in, in the same way that is it possible in, in you know, this whole, this, this a nice debate that they used to have, can you reach a point? This is, a, the, a, they usually have this debate about um, the Hallaj. Uh, was Hallaj ultimately wrong when he said, Laysa fi illallah, that, that there's nothing inside of me except Allah? Can a, true, can a seeker truly think that they have reached a point where they've diluted themselves entirely and so thoroughly um, that their journey with humility is done because now they, 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 they've become one and you know completely emasculated and all that. And what's fascinating is that even the, the most uh, ecstatic of them, like Rabbi al and so on, would still say, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, uh, that I've reached the end of the journey, and and that the, or that the journey does have an end, and that's why in her poetry when she says that Hayai Hayai Minka Yuvaidni Wada Ashopi Adoni that even her that she, her relationship with Allah is is it's like it contracts and retracts. It's back and forth. She she's able to come closer at times and drifts away at times. And so the, there is no end to the journey of humility. I, I no, I, I would completely agree with that. It is endless. Um, any other questions about Surat al Hamza? Do you want to tackle just a couple of poems from Nansu? Yeah. Um, um, I mean, these are ta ta I, the, the questions Grace are referring to. Is what I have a question about some uh, scholars, notable, most notably from Tunis, from Tunisia, 
said that Muslims should not go to Hajj as long as Saudi Arabia is committing atrocities that Saudi Arabia is committing in Yemen. And so someone, or not, I mean, so, so several people have written asking me about that. Um, and then there is a question from India uh, that a group of uh, Hindu extremists had slaughtered about 70 Muslims. Um, and as a response, Muslims were protesting the massacre of the 70 by praying in public spaces. And there was a, a man who, who was Hindu who converted to Islam, who passed away, and then his family insisted that he would be given a Hindu burial and not a Muslim burial, so they burned his corpse. And the question was, is it, is it lawful to do Salat al-Janazah, Salat al on someone who was given a Hindu burial instead of a Muslim burial? Um, and according to the question that they, they wanted the response because it, it affects the way that they organize their protests. Um, for for me, uh, because I know that the, the especially the folks in India, uh, there's some urgency because apparently these protests are, are going on or or they're they're waiting. Um, yeah. First, I, I want to say that. It, it, one thing is, is clear, and there is no, uh, I mean, we can say with, with a, a very high level of confidence that Salat al is performed according to the intention of the deceased, not the dispensation of the physical body of the deceased. So. An unjust ruler could execute a Muslim, because this has happened in human history, in, in, in Muslim history, and then order Muslims not to perform Salat al janaza or funeral prayer. You don't, it's not only you don't have to obey, but you should not obey, and you should do the Salat al janaza anyway, because the, the person who died, died as a Muslim. Similarly, People could die, the, the physical body could disappear. So we have people who drown in an ocean, we never retrieve their physical body. We have people who die in avalanches, we never retrieve their physical body. And yet we do the funeral prayer according to intentionality because they died with the intention of being a Muslim. And so the dispensation, the dispensation, whatever happens to the physical body, is irrelevant to the decision to do Salat al -Janaza. So the fact that this brother converted to Islam, died, and then his family, which is Hindu, took his body and incinerated it rather than buried it, is irrelevant for the purposes of doing Salat al -Janaza. You perform Salat al janaza on him as if he was a, because he was a Muslim and he died with the Shahada, and whatever happened to his body is is entirely irrelevant. As to a prayer as a form of protest, this is also a question that we can answer with a very high level of confidence. Very recently, in the Arab Spring. Uh, Prayers in Tunisia and in Egypt and in Syria, the protesters were often start praying uh, as a form of protest. And actually, one of the very shameful things that in which you, you was very really revealing as to the natures of the governments that were confronting them is that they were 
frequently attacked while in prayer because in Islamic theology, prayer has a sanctity. And if people are praying, by the way, whether they're Muslim or not, so you cannot even attack a Christian in prayer or a Jew in prayer. And there is some very fascinating material about the law of war in, in that. Um, I mean, if you uh, lay siege to, to a fort, and then once you enter it, you find people are in, in, in prayer. Uh, you, you have to wait for them until they're done with prayer, and you can't attack them. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, declaring prayer as a, as a form of creating space to call upon the conscience of people to say, stop the bloodshed, think about what you're doing, has, is, is a very deeply rooted tradition um, and especially in the Islamic civilization. And one of the signs of deterioration in, in, um, of modern Islam is the, 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 the refusal to recognize the sanctity of prayer and attacking people who are in prayer, as we saw in the Arab Spring, unfortunately. So it, it, anyone that tells you, no, the, you shouldn't use prayer as a protest, it's not based on, on anything in jurisprudence or in the, the mechanics of Sharia. Uh, uh, when you are praying, you are, you're, you're truly supplicating to God to guide people to something that is more moral and more virtuous than slaughter. So in other words, those people who slaughtered the 70 Muslims, it's as if you're supplicating God, and at the same time you're reminding them that honor the space of divinity. Um, so for, for if, and it's a dignified and elevated means of protest. And it, since I received that, the, the message was quite long. It was a very long letter um, by the folks organizing the protests and so on. Uh, it, I, I have been praying for you. And and, and they, part of the letter, they, they say that because of the rising Islamophobia, even in India, and responding to Islamophobia with prayer is a very elevated and dignified and virtuous and Islamic way of protesting. And may Allah be with you, and may Allah aid you and support you. And and, and lift your hardships, inshallah. Let's postpone the Hajj one, because that one will take uh, more unpacking. And, uh, I can't just say yes and no without explaining why I say what I say. It's 7.46 now. This is kind of a loaded question, so it's up to you whether you want to answer it or not, but Considering the recent uh, Supreme Court case, or not the case, but with Dr. Ford testifying against Bert Kavanaugh for the seat of the Supreme Court Justice, and um, concerning uh, Imam Zaid Shakir's initial Facebook post in which he stated that um, Islamically, Dr. Ford's testimony is not evidence enough of um, sexual assault, and he also an analogized sexual assault to zina, um, what in, in, the, in the Sharia and Islamic system, what constitutes evidence, in the case of sexual assault, what constitutes evidence? Is uh, testimony not enough? Do they need like eyewitnesses? Like, and given the, in the modern age we have digital records, photography, uh, videotapes, um, so yeah, what my question is what the, constitutes? The reason I'm smiling is that uh, we, we actually started the halakha talking about uh, about this, but uh, the part we didn't talk about um, is what does constitute evidence for sexual assault. Um, uh, the law of zina and the law of slander is within the purview of hudud. Hudud means that the rights of God 
are mixed with the rights of human beings, but the rights of God, it's, it's as if they are areas where God had, had addressed specifically and created space for them specifically. So the law of four witnesses and the law of oath, li'an, oath and counter oath. Number one, a had never applies outside a Muslim polity. So to, to, to say, to come up with the law of four witnesses in a non-Muslim party is absolute nonsense. How does hudud, the, the, the hudud punishments, the, uh, the, 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 the ones that, that were addressed specifically by God, in, so they are zina, drinking alcohol, slander, um, uh, 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 theft, stealing, robbery, uh, uh, stealing, and um, uh, and then apostasy and hiraba are two debated ones. The uh, uh, hiraba, uh, in rebellion book, I talk about those who said that this is had and those who said it's not, and uh, apostasy uh, again because it 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 is premised on what the jurisprudence of Abu Bakr, not on the Quranic text. Um, but the ones that, that we all recognize are zina, slander, drinking alcohol, and uh, uh, stealing. Zina is adultery. Adultery. Funny, sugar, yeah. You know, it's good that you, you <laughs> always uh, make me... So anyway, but when it comes special, especially to the law of slander and four witnesses, it's a had. وَلَا يُقَاسُ عَلَى had. You can't extend the law by analogy on the basis of a had. A had is like something that a God bracketed it, and I'll tell you precisely why. It's because God doesn't care about the, the enforcement of the punishment, but cares about the moral lesson to be extracted from the punishment. So it's a very old medieval way of um, of articulating law where you you enunciate a very severe punishment but you make the application of the punishment impossible and the point is is that you you want to communicate a moral lesson but in Islam in jurisprudence until the Wahhabis came along the principle was la <laughs> yuqasu you can't extend the law from had to a derivative law because what was enunciated through the rules of evidence of Allah cannot be extended. And what is remarkable is the, the ones in, from the medieval age, the ones who um, uh, init initiated the debate about in Islamic jurisprudence about rape and the difference between rape and fornication and adultery. Uh, first, it started with the Maliki jurist. And there was a very famous fatwa by Ibn Rushd, the grandfather, not the philosopher, where uh, uh, there were a group of people who broke into a home. They went, uh, after they, uh, they stole stuff, they raped a woman in there. And Ibn Rushd refused to... Uh, uh, said the, the, to, to require four witnesses, something like that, it is completely, makes absolutely no sense, and ruled that either testimony or circumstantial evidence would be enough to establish the case. So he took, including um, uh, the witnesses of, the, uh, of people could, position to witness the events. In other words, so if if the only people positioned to witness the events were victims of the crime, <coughs> normally in Islamic law we don't take the testimony of the witnesses of the crime for the purposes of establishing a fact. But Ibn Rush said that for when it comes to crimes like that, crimes involving assault and victimization and preying on the vulnerabilities of people, 
then the testimony of the wit of the victim of the crime, in fact, must be taken. Now, we know from al Bayan al Tahsil that initially there was controversy in that some resisted Ibn Rushd's uh, fatwa. But I have found in Kitab al Asl by Shaybani, which is a Hanafi text, which is centuries before Ibn Rushd, I actually found the same fatwa already in, in a Hanafi source, in Kitab al Asl by Shaybani, centuries earlier. But what becomes, to, to make a longer story short, that what becomes accepted as the Islamic civilization moves from tribalism to urbanism. Because in tribal society, you can control crime fairly well just through tribal ties. And if a crime occurs through tribal connections, you, you can pretty much know who's doing what, and you don't lose track of anyone. But as Muslims increasingly move to urban realities and the realities of moving and shifting populations where faces are changing all the time, is that circumstantial evidence was accepted contrary to what Orientalists say and the testimony of victims became, and rape was seen increasingly as a crime of hirama, as, as in, and, and uh, um, brigandish, uh, as a, a, a form of terrorism. And so in my rebellion book, I talk, uh, towards the end of the book, I talk a great deal about how uh, it, uh, Muslim jurists apply the rules of evidence, not just from the Maliki school, but even Hanafis and Shafi'is and even Hanbalis applied the, the, the same rules of evidence, which were very um, uh, exploratory and investigative in nature. And that is why when modernity started coming in, Muslim jurists, from, whether from Azhar or Qarawain in, in, in Morocco or in uh, the jurists of, of uh, West Africa or the jurists of India, it, had, it was a non-issue for them, had no difficulty initially uh, applying the principle of circumstantial evidence to crimes, what they used to call crimes of honor, jara uh, and And uh, what's interesting is that, again, I, I'm, it always does go back to this, we, we saw the retreat from that initial response to modernity with the rise of Wahhabi slash Salafi, where we started, and, and particularly in, 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 so you take some of Saudi Arabia, since I've read a lot of criminal law, Saudi criminal law. One of the most amazing things to me is that you find uh, all these cases that you find uh, a man and a woman sitting in a car. You convict them six uh, months in prison, a year in prison, and a hundred lashes or three hundred lashes. And then a woman comes and says, this man raped me. You say, well, you don't have four witnesses. And in fact, I have, there were a lot of cases in which the woman is sentenced to lashes for accusing the man. Now, Again, Allah gave us brains, right? You take any group of human beings and you replace that woman with your sister, your mother, your daughter, and the sense of offense will be universal. And in fact, I'll tell you, if that is Islam, a lot of people will say we don't want Islam. Most decent human beings will say, if you're gonna, any woman that comes forward that says, uh, my, 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 you know, all these poor servant girls that work in homes and, and then they have their, 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 their employer, you know, from Bangladesh and India and Pakistan and so on, they sneak into their bedrooms at night and sexually abuse them and, and then in all these cases we read that 
even the sexual abuses posted on the net in some websites. I mean, so it's there. And that's how wives usually find out, or, you know, they find out. And yet, complete immunity. Someone wants to tell me that's Islam? Impossible. No God worthy of worship would legitimate or accept these egregious injustices. And a proper system of justice, Sharia, which is based on the notion of justice, would always premise itself on how to, to bring an end to evil. That, and that type of evil, which it, 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 one of the, I mean, you, you asked a question that just touches upon all the sore points. Because I teach human trafficking and, and, and one of the things that, that really, um, do you know that uh, when, when I first learned that, I went into a serious depression, that, that now a constant item in pornographic sites is Islamic themes or Arab themes. Yeah. I, I didn't, yeah. I have no idea. And then, oh, yeah. when, and then when I read that most of this stuff is premised on the sexual abuse of domestic workers and poor women from... I mean, if you have, as a, as a Muslim, that should make your blood boil to no end. I mean, if it's happening at that scale, women who... The only reason they go work in homes of of of, uh, of men, and it, and they they're away from their husbands and from their fathers and from their brothers is because they're poor. And they go work in these, you know, and then uh, they become somehow. It, it, it's just it's it's shocking. It's it's endless. So. When I saw that fatwa that you're referring to, immediately what enraged me is because it, it's all connected. When you say that about a situation like this in the U.S., a good jurist, leave alone a conscientious human being, would immediately think about the implications of what you're saying for all these thousands upon thousands of poor, abused women who are put, are victimized by the same jargon and have to suffer sexual abuse and keep their mouth shut because they can't get four witnesses and if they go to the police station, they, they, they'll get punished. And, how could this happen in Muslim lands? Even the fact that the evidence is right there uh, on the net. And then when you talk to these... What do I call them? And they tell you, oh, but that's not evidence in Sharia, brother. You know that? Then, then, you, you, don't call me brother. I'm not your brother. If, if you accept this with a straight face, it, it's, 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 it's horrific. It, it's horrific. And it, it, it feeding into the, the, the apologetics that empowers these institutions is no less horrific. And any Muslim from our parts of the world would have heard stories of what's going on because it, it is so systematic and widespread. It's terrifying. I mean, we, we, how can, in, in the human trafficking reports, how can Muslim countries be among the, the highest ranked human trafficking abusers, abusers and we sit there and talk about uh, Sharia requiring four witnesses? I mean, I, I, that, that, uh, because, you know, there, 
I, I, when you find that type of stuff from coming from Saudi Arabia, you you understand the patriarchal and the elitist and the the, the, the the corruptions of privilege. But when you find it coming out of American Muslims, then freedom and liberty and education didn't elevate you. And that's very depressing. You know, I might excuse you if you're back home and you're oppressed because if you say anything else, you go to prison. Because that's what happens in Saudi Arabia. If you disagree, they throw you in prison, as happened to several respectable jurors. But what is your excuse if you're in the U.S. and you say stuff like that? Yeah, this is what we started the Halakha, I was sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I should go back and listen to it. Yeah, sorry. I, I, was, yeah, we were, I had a class. That's okay. But, yeah, uh, thank you for answering the question on what constitutes uh, mm -hmm. evidence against sexual assault. Where there's a precedent for circumstantial evidence. Yeah. Because I didn't even... I don't think yeah, I mean, it, it's not... It, it, it is circumstantial evidence, and it, it is... Because it, it, sexual assault... It, well, if... If you're going to apply a capital punishment, then the majority said that you need capital punishment meaning death. Yeah. Uh, then the majority said you need two witnesses for it. But anything short of capital punishment, all the ta'zir, imprisonment, uh, banishment, and, and, and flogging, or, you know, of course, uh, uh, we don't do flogging in the modern age of Wishmi. But th then it. it then, uh, including the testimony of the victim would be sufficient for the punishment. Um, I mean, it is, if you, if you read in Qutb al-Qadar, you'll find a lot being written about that you should seek collaborating circumstantial evidence. So, you know, injuries, bruises, uh, broken pottery, I mean, that's the examples you usually give. Multiple uh, women. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, okay. yeah the, the, it's, uh, uh, cumulative testimony of multiple victims and, and, and so on. The, the, and even in cumulative testimony, because I, there was a ayar, ayar, or sometimes called the shuttar, but usually the ayar. Ayar is a is a repeat offender who is is. Re, sort of repeatedly harassing women or sexually assaulting women or even possibly men. And with these people, you can take the seerah. The, you can actually go and just collect the, the cumulative testimonies of various victims that suffered from this person. And then, as a result, uh, um, um, banish them uh, or imprison them uh, or, and so on and so forth. But, yeah, I, I just nothing in really gets under my skin, especially with, with the problem, the enormous problem of human trafficking, including human trafficking committed by Muslims, which... Uh, 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 the, you know, the, the way that this four witnesses thing feeds into the human trafficking industry is, is, is enraging. Because that's not what, what, what the point of... Uh, the idea was to protect the honor of women from slander. You know, it's saying don't, don't slander a, a woman unless you have witnesses. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we took it and we flipped it on its head and then ended up victimizing women with it. Mm -hmm. This is disgusting. Okay? I'm not happy now. I'm not happy now. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, thank you. Alhamdulillah.